And welcome to the PHLY Eagles podcast on a Friday high noon big show ahead. We're going to be joined by the professor, Dane Is Selman, coming up in a little bit. But before we get to that, Bo Wolf, Zach Berman, from the jump, we are on with Coach Flynn, the wide receivers coach at Princeton. You know him. You love him. Coach, thank you for joining us. Great to be here, guys. Draft season. Let's get it. Let's get it. I love that. Right there. Right to business. Draft season. Let's, let's my kind get, of guy let's right get there. right to it. Let's yep. talk wide receivers. Now, the Eagles are not going to, you know, realistically have a chance at one of these top receivers in the draft, even if they wanted to add that position. But uh, we, we've spent some time together, Coach, watching these guys. This is your expertise. I want to, uh, I want to give you a chance. And I, I know that, that Zach may not be on board with this, but trusting the eyes, there's a guy in this class who – you and I liked a little bit more than Marvin Harrison Jr. Who was wide receiver one for you? Yeah, so and we watched him actually in this this very room right here, which you may confuse for a, a cell in the county jail. It's actually my office. I was going to say Cold, Cold War bunker. Yeah, but it's, we're safe against anything here. Anything happens, we're good. <laughs> That's where Einstein um, was, literally, right? So, yes. he, not far from here. Yeah, not far. <laughs> I, I, big wide receiver guy, Albert. Um, <laughs> I, I like neighbors. E equals wide receiver uh, I've liked neighbors. Yeah, I've liked Malik Neighbors as number one from mm. uh, for the, a bunch of months. Uh, I think he's just so explosive, so good with the ball in his hand. Uh, there was a while I liked Odunze as much as Marv, but I think Marv is, is ahead of Rome in that way. But I think Neighbors after the catch, Neighbors against man coverage. Uh, he's just a different guy. You know, he's he's explosive. Uh, you, you see him a lot against the best DBs in the country. It's kind of like it's like Devontae Smith in, in the respect of who he's going against is as good as you're going to go against in terms of the back end guys uh, in the SEC and with the schedule they play. And he's just running away from people. And even in the you know the, the the throws that are short, you know he's breaking tackles. He's explosive. I just think he adds an element uh, as a ball carrier that's a little bit better than, than Marvin Harrison. Again, I think they're both great players. Uh, but I've been that way for a little while. Um, I've watched not everybody, but most of them. And I, I, I say that because last time I was on, we were talking about the Eagles offense. And I said I hadn't watched the film and I got absolutely crushed afterwards, which was, was kind of cool. Um, but this, time <laughs> actually, this time I actually did watch the film and do my homework. I didn't just show up randomly after the holidays spouting takes. Uh, but I do oh, like dude. neighbors as the, as, the, as the number one wide out overall. What do we make of that today? Okay. Yeah, look, it's it's a uh, at that point, I think it's a, it's a matter of preference, right? Um, I can see it with with neighbors. I prefer Marvin Harrison Jr. Totally I, realist, reasonable. Yeah, I prefer Roma Dunze over neighbors. Interesting, but, but I'm not gonna like I'm not gonna say uh, pick. I I think all three of them are really good players to me. A Dunze in terms of like the size, you talk about the ability to, to uh, have production after the catch. You look at the overall production that he had. Um, with just a loaded group around him, I I was so impressed with a, with a Dunze at every data point uh, throughout the year. But uh, look, Marvin Harrison Jr. When you see Philadelphia, PA, you see St. Joseph's yeah. Prep, um, and then there it is. Else, yeah, this is what I'll say uh, about Marvin Harrison Jr. And um, you guys can all back me up on on this. He was on a wide receiver core that has like all pros on it. You know, Garrett Wilson, Chris Olave. Um, you know, Jackson Smith in, um, in, in, in Jigba. Um, and he was the best player on sure. that group, right? And that's not me saying that. Like, the Ohio State guys will tell you. And I, I think Brian Hartline, their wide receivers coach, said that. Like, Marvin Harrison Jr. was the best player in that group, right? And so I, just, I, I think Marvin Harrison Jr. could be a star for the next 10 years. But I, th I, think, I think all three of them, this is a good year to be needing a, a wide receiver yeah. in the draft because you're, you're going to get a guy – at 10 or 12 or, or, or maybe eight or nine, let's say, who would typically be a top five pick. Yeah, I don't I don't know that if I was actually the one making the decision, I could bring myself to take someone over Marvin Harrison Jr., given the the profile and the and the production and even like the, just the group think. But 
just watching Neighbors, it's like Marvin Harrison is built to be like the perfect wide receiver. And like it seems like everything he does is like to, to perfect the craft. Whereas Malik Neighbors is out there just like trying to steal your food. Like he, yeah, he's, he's going to melt like, your face with the ball in his hand. That's what he's yeah. trying to do. Yeah, he's um, running right at your nose and saying, tackle me. And not for nothing, a full year younger and just as productive uh, in his in his college career. So uh, just just worth noting. Now, also real quick, Devontae Smith's Heisman Trophy bow, he had Malik Neighbors over Marvin Harrison Jr. He thought Malik Neighbors was the best receiver in college football last year. He liked Harrison Jr. more as a prospect, but he thought Neighbors was the best receiver last year in college football. I like that. You had that You had that scoop on all PHLY.com. Good stuff. Uh, all right, let's move beyond those those top three guys, Coach. Who is like the next guy beyond that group who – who has caught your eye that, that you really like? I mean, I like Brian Thomas kind of for the same reasons. Uh, the guy I like more than a lot of people is Keon Coleman. Hmm. Uh, you know, he ran four, six, I think. And so everybody's like, Oh my God, it's over for him. He's cooked. Uh, and I thought, actually I thought Tory Smith had a good tweet on that. He's like four, six is actually fast. <laughs> for everybody that thinks like four, six is slow. Like that's actually running pretty good. Tory Smith was a fast guy. Um, I just like, I call, I like Coleman's body control. You know, he's he's his ball skills are awesome. He may make some really absurd plays, particularly early in the year. Like I know he was banged up a little bit at the end, but for the first month, six weeks of the season, you know, the film I watched, I thought he was the best receiver in the country and yeah. then kind of tell off there a little bit. I think when he got ding, but he was really good. Uh, you know, I like A.D. Mitchell, uh, yeah. you know, as a bigger guy who was a hard edge guy when he was at Georgia. Like you just see him blocking and doing the dirty work, but also winning one on one and. You know, I think he's got an upside as a route runner. I think he can get better. Um, you know, Lad McConkey for me has been a journey. Um, it, there was so much early hype about Lad McConkey, like I didn't want to like him. Like I thought some of the some of the comps I think are ridiculous. Like they're like, oh, he's like Antonio Brown. Right. Yeah. What? <laughs> uh, no, he's not. Now, I think he'll be a good pro, but I think he's way overvalued. Um, on a lot of people's sports, but I think he'll be good. Like, I don't think he's gonna be a buster. He stinks or anything like that. And then again, I, I kind of yada yada it, but the guy, so every, you know, this is a flex, but every Sunday coming here and I was just trying to see that the teams that were the best on offense, get ideas for the week, you know, stuff like that. So I watched Washington every week because Washington I thought was the best offense in college football. And so, you know, I watched Roma Dunze every week. Uh, and he was, he was spectacular. You know, again, I don't think he's as explosive as the other guys, but, you know, like if you watch the explosive plays on him, it's not nearly as good as as neighbors or Marv. But if you watch him like contested, fourth down, low red, uh, you know, all that stuff, like he's his it's the old you know high floor, low ceiling. Uh, so I do think he is in that that group of three guys. I do think he'll be a good player pretty quickly. Um, you know, some of the other guys, again, I think I like Troy Franklin more than a lot of people do. Yes. Okay. I'm glad you say that. You and I are thinking Yeah, yeah. he's, he's, you know, I understand all the knocks, but like you put the film on and again, he's a guy they, they hung their hat on when it, when it mattered third down, fourth down red zone, you know, against USC. I think every catch was like an 85 yard catch against USC, which yeah. now again, yeah. USC did knock a lot of guys down on defense very mm -hmm. often, but I think I probably like him a little bit. Him and Keon Coleman, I think I probably like a little bit more than most. You know, I've got my my wide receiver buckets ready to go, mm. of course. And you're looking Always. for guys who who hit all who check all three boxes, over a thousand yards receiving in a season, uh, better than four or five speed, and did not stay the entirety of their college career. Left early. There are only five guys in the class who hit it: Marvin Harrison Jr., Malik Neighbors, Brian Thomas, who you mentioned, Xavier Worthy from Texas, and your boy. Troy Franklin. So those are those are your five there. I have a question for you. Xavier Worthy. Xavier Worthy is spectacular, man. I mean, he's I know he struggled catching the ball, but somebody's going to take a flyer on him and uh, as a guy that can just hit home runs. And so I think this is my question. Right to do that. Why is it that Xavier Worthy was the more productive of the two at Texas with A.D. Mitchell, ran faster, and is still considered the second of the two as a prospect? Zach, why don't, why don't you tell me why that is? Well, I think actually A.D. Mitchell has has caught on some some steam um, during the pre-draft process when you look at at the size-speed combination. That's what jumps out, you know, 6'2", sub, uh, a sub-4440. Four, four but A.D. Mitchell, and this is what I like about him, you go back to even when he was at Georgia, and Coach Flynn said when you're playing down there, it's the, the, it's the Devontae Smith thing. You're playing against cornerbacks you'll see in the pros. You look at A.D. Mitchell's games, 
going back to Georgia, when when he played against Michigan, when he played against Ohio State, when he played against Alabama, um, you know, when he he played against Alabama last year, he's scoring touchdowns in every one of those games, right? He's someone who now I I know touchdowns are, are not necessarily like a stat that could be sticky, but it's he he makes big plays in so many of these games. He's a pro. Xavier Worthy is electric. I I, I think the the question with with Xavier Worthy is you need a coach as good as Coach Flynn sometimes, right? Who like because there's a thought you need to scheme him up, and I always say if that's the thought, like that's what coaches are there for. If the guys can just run out and you know and 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 just play in the backyard, it's it's me coaching my son's flag football team, right? Like the idea undefeated as head coach, by the way. <laughs> no, but the idea Har- harder that, to do than you than you should. That's harder to do than you're giving yourself credit yeah. for right there. No, but I'm yeah. I'm always skeptical of or I, I never like to hear uh, you need a, a real creative coach like. Yeah, that's what they're paid to do is is take a guy who's special talents and make the special talents sing. So I wouldn't be worried about Xavier Worthy just because you need to find ways to scheme him up. I think that's fair. Coach, you have any like good advice for for Zach? He's got his <laughs> his second game tonight. Oh, Where's second flag football game tonight? Yes. Is the center eligible in your league? Yes, Zach, he like, is. After he hikes it. Yeah, yep. he's he's money in the bank. Like whenever there's a problem, just go to the center. They forget they forget that almost every Game time. Game winning touchdown last week, throwing really? to the center. Oh yes, yeah. my yes. man. Yes. All right. yes, yes, nice Center job. eligible. Yep. Uh, since you watched the the Washington uh, tape a lot, I want to ask you about Jalen Polk, who is I think my favorite guy of the day two guys relative to like where he seems to be ranked in the class. Uh, I really liked what I saw from from Jalen Polk. Yeah, they were, again, as a group, I thought they were the, the best in the country. I mean, I think I thought Penix, I, again, it's probably why I like Penix more the most, uh, but I think he's underrated. You know, I mean, if you look at his, I'm going to test the numbers here. They're all pretty good. Um, you know, I think it's it, it's hard as the second guy sometimes uh, to get him incorporated, but Brian Greba Washington did such a good job. Yeah, if the Eagles got him in, in the second or the third round or the second, whatever that is, the second day, that would be, I'd be all for it. I teased uh, on yesterday's show. I, I said there's a guy who I really like on the, on on day two, who I think in a different year would would go day one. And you took the words out of my mouth. That was that was Troy Franklin. Um, when I look at Troy Franklin, what am I missing? Or I, I I guess what is it that is it is it just the strength of this year's class that he's he's falling down? Because you look at the time speed, you look at the college production. Um, the the knock you hear is that he's 178 pounds. I've heard that knock with a wide receiver in in, in Philadelphia who's who's about to get paid twenty five million dollars a year, right? Like, I I get it. I I wouldn't take someone who doesn't have production, who's an outlier in 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 terms of the slight frame. But every time I, I watched Oregon, he was running past the guys on the other team. Um, to me, there's there's like value in doing that on a week in week out basis. Your first point is a good one. Like the class is deep. And so when there's that many good players, you know, they're looking to ding you for really anything they can find. And, you know, the size deal, the size speed deal, it, it, it's funny with, with Devontae, like he was so good fundamentally. He's so good with his ball skills. Um, he's like almost an outlier. He is an outlier really, you know, and he, he was just, he's that good. Um, I, you know, I don't think Franklin is in that boat. And I think that's probably why he's been knocked down a little bit again, because when you go up, you know, like I said, there is a Keon Coleman, there is a Marv, sure. there is a Roman. There are guys that are size speed guys with the production. Uh, it's funny though, because when you, I, I said this to the recruits in here all the time, like even in our room, we have guys that are six, five, we have guys that are five, seven, like the, the position is generating separation from somebody else. It's getting yourself open. Like when you, when you, when I saw, when I saw you guys last year at the Eagles uh, OTA or whatever that was, like when you look at the line at the Eagles, you're like AJ Brown and Devontae Smith play the same position. Like, how's that even possible? <laughs> yep. You know, so I think, but I also, I, I remember when Devontae was coming out, I, there, there was a couple of scouts and guys that coach in the league that were like, no way off the board. Can't do it. Not big enough guy. That small's never done it. No, no, no. Like I think what, what gets knocked down right now is production, you know, because they, they know that, okay, these measurables always work. And what, in truth, it's the always isn't isn't what happens. You know, there are guys that can do it, but I think again, there's enough people that meet those marks uh, ahead of him on the board that I think that is, you know, he's got ding for that. So, uh, sort of along those lines, philosophically, like if if you were the one 
in charge of designing the Eagles offense, coach. And Howie Roseman came to you and was like, what, what type of wide receiver do you want to add to Devontae Smith and A.J. Brown? Is there like a, a type that you would want, or would you just say, get me the best guy and I will, and I will figure it out? Yeah, I mean, I think the, you always have to be number two. Like, whoever you give me, we can figure it out. With those two guys, like, whoever, I mean, whoever the third guy is, I think you're good, if that makes sense. Um, but I, I think you, you, you have a clear one and clear two, and your two is, is a one for a lot of teams. So what are you looking for? You're looking for a number three guy who's actually like a viable guy. Like, I just feel like they haven't had, you know, as, as even like a Hunter Renfro or like somebody who's just, you know, can, can make plays in between the hash marks for you, you know, can do the dirty work. Um, you love you know, Hunter Renfro. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm not, he's, I mean, there's not enough guys with my hairline or worse <laughs> playing in the NFL right now, you know? So, but like a Jason Avant, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, I think they've had shades of those guys, but like never anybody that is like a winning player in there to me. Like they've been very interchangeable. Uh, God forbid one of those guys has a helmet break, in, you know, on a two minute drive and somebody else had to go in outside because I don't think they weren't going to be able to hold up their end of the bargain. So I think whoever it is, body type or whatever, like I think the quality of that third guy has to drastically improve. Who do you like on day three? You know, it, it, we talked a little bit about it. Uh, the guy that I've seen a million times on film, exchange film is Jalen Coker from Holy Cross. He's probably, a, a you know, a, a further down the road guy, but he was just a big receiver, a good, really good change of direction, really good ball skills. Like all the good defenses that we played, he crushed them. Um, you know, he's kind of he's kind of the best guy that I saw, not just on our, you know, film exchange from the course of our, our past two seasons. Uh, you know, I think he's really, really good. I'm trying to think here. Look at the rest of my. I don't. I, I don't mind a Johnny Wilson, a hmm. huge guy, uh, who I think can develop. You know, the Eagles have kind of had that guy in there. I feel like in training camp every year, just a really big yes. raw dude that they're trying to trying to. You know, we're going to take a flyer on him, and he's going to be like the Mylotta of the outside receivers and become a Joseph player. Gata. Yeah, I mean, there's a long list. I mean, Bo would remember every single guy and know know the day he got cut. Uh, but there's, you know, I think somebody like that. Um, you know, those are really the two that jump out from, from my notes. All right. Well, coach, what, what insight as always, how about any quickly, any, any of the corners? Cause I know we, we spent some time watching the corners, uh, that, that you really liked. The guy from Clemson. Yeah. Uh, I thought he was awesome. I hmm. thought he was, uh, just a baller, you know, like a competitor, get in your face, chase down, cause fumbles. The two guys from Alabama were awesome. I thought, um, Every, every defensive guy's name is escaping me right now because I'm in spring ball. I'm, I can't talk That's to okay. you. I can't remember uh, sort of any defense. But those were the three guys, I think, that jumped out at me. I did not love Cooper DeGene. I thought he was okay, probably safety-ish when all is said and done. I know his numbers are different than that. Uh, Mitchell from Toledo I thought was awesome in the senior bowl one-on-ones. Yes. I mean, obviously, I think he's probably going to be picked before uh, – you know, the Eagles get a chance to pick him, but like he was a guy that you watch your film, like, oh man, this is a good player. And then you watch Senior Bowl one and one, you're like, holy cow, he's smoking everybody. Like nobody's getting any separation. Uh, and that is probably Mount Union bias because the head coach and the defense coordinator at Toledo are both Mount Union guys, uh, full disclosure. Zach's language. Uh, but I do think they need a corner. I mean, I think, I mean, I know I'm stating the obvious, but like we got to, something's got to be done. Everybody's getting, getting old out there and, you know, it, it I mean, I think Bradbury is right now still listed as a one, right? You guys, I mean, mm. you got to do something about that, you know? <laughs> I think that's probably fair. My, uh, and my last one for you, um, for you, this, this might be some form of confirmation bias because I, I don't have the data behind it. It seems uh, just when I was looking at this and, and then going through Dane Brewer's The Beast, shout out Mount Union, right? That, um, that there's a lot of, there's a lot more Ivy League guys this year. What? And perhaps it's because of the transfer rules, right? Guys who who played Ivy League football and then they they went to a a bigger a quote unquote bigger school thereafter. Um, in this draft, is it is the strength of the Ivy not getting enough credit? Um, are is this confirmation bias on, on my end, or are you seeing that as well that there are more draft prospects with Ivy League backgrounds? Yeah, I mean, I think I think we get I think FCS football in general doesn't get enough credit. I think the Ivy gets decent credit, but I think. You know, that was the big knock on Andre last year. Um, you know, he tested great. 
he has a, he's a little bit older, but he, Andre has a big upside and it, he still, he got dinged for that stuff. You know, I think, you know, there's a lot, it's funny because Ivy league guys now, you know, the rules, a lot of guys for their fifth year are transferring to power fives yep. and, and getting an extra year that way. And it's, you know, the transfer portal really doesn't affect us except for that, you know, guys who have completed their eligibility here, but still have a red shirt year, uh, go play power five. And then, you know, a decent amount of those guys are, are draft eligible or, you know, guys that end up getting picked. And I think that's, you know, that's something that's different. Uh, and it's, and bec- you know, if you take a guy from this league, like they're, they're, they're glue guys. They're never, there's never going to be an issue. Uh, they're going to work their tail off. They're going to be on time. Uh, pick, they're going to bring up your team GPA, all that good stuff. And it's, but it's just like college, it's just like college basketball. They're also like established players. Like there are guys, 30, 25 game starters in our league that can help teams out you know, as, as, as a nickel or can help teams out that are looking for, uh, you know, a specific positional need, you know, so I think that's been different. I think again, FCS in general, you know, I think it's, it's, it's very easy. It takes a little more projection. Um, you know, it takes a little more evaluation. And so I think a lot of people are just like, nah, we're, we'll go with the guy from, you know, the, 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 the third receiver from a, from a power four, power five school before the best FCS guy. But again, I think it's, I think it has improved, you know, in the, my 25 years doing it, you know, I mean, Brian Westbrook, I think went in the third round. Yep. Uh, when I was at Villanova um, and, and, you know, you could, the, the whole running back thing went into play there, but I mean, what he tested out, how he played, he probably could have been higher. Uh, but even then that for us was like, Oh my goodness. You know, that's, that was super high back in those days where again, you're seeing it more and more now quarterbacks getting picked and, and stuff like that. So, it's it's the bottom line is it's an inexact science and there's way too many coaches or ex coaches involved in it uh, that think that they know everything and they're exactly right all the time, and so it gets screwed up. Same as it ever was, Coach. Thank you so much. Thanks, guys. Great being on. Look forward to talking to you soon. Great to see you. Great to see you. Great to uh, carry on the tradition. Thank you. Have a great weekend, Coach. We uh, we look forward to talking to you again soon. See you guys. All right, let me tell you everybody about Truemark Financial Credit Union because when you join a credit union like Truemark Financial, you become part owner, which means the profits come back to you instead of going to the shareholders. Better rates, lower fees, a better return on savings, and more flexible options with all the same digital tools and tech to make our lives easier. Truemark has local roots, headquartered in Fort Washington with 24 branches in the Philadelphia area. They serve our community and our people right here at home. Becoming a member of a credit union has so many benefits over being a customer at a bank. It is a total no-brainer, just like trading up to number one overall and taking Brock Bowers. Head over to truemark.com slash PHOI to learn more or to find a branch near you. That's truemark.com slash PHOI, federally insured by the NCUA. Not Bo, I'm not I'm not totally buttoned up from from time to time, more than time to time. I, I like to take out my phone and and oh. and and open up a, a a sports gambling app. And uh the app that I like to go to now is Bet Parks. Uh because we are brought to you by Bet Parks. You can get in the zone with the Bet Park Sports Book app. Money is in the moments. What events are coming? Well, well there's a lot of events coming. You got the Phillies Pirates this weekend. Um yeah. Some people bet on the draft. There's, there's, uh, I don't do that, but there's, um, there's a lot of, you know, the NBA playoffs are coming up, NHL playoffs are coming up. Uh, if you're checking out some of those late night baseball games, which I do, sometimes it's always fun to, to get some live action in. No. Um, win big with all day action. Win your first ten dollar bet and earn one hundred and twenty five dollars in sports bonus bets. You play for fun. You love to win. You bet. Download the app and play along with us. You must be 21 years or older. Please gamble responsibly. If you or someone you know has a gambling problem and wants help, call 1-800-GAMBLER. Welcome to the set, everybody. The professor himself, Deniz. How are you, Deniz? Doing well, thank you. Uh, how are you guys? It's been a while. Long time no Too see. Too long, yep. My first time in this uh, in this oh, smaller so studio. Friendly confines yeah. of Studio B. It's, it's a nice. little more intimate, a little more, uh, you know, you get the... You get the the desk here. I think I, I tend to prefer a Studio B. If you had told me, I would not have worn pants, but it's a waste. Mm, well, I I mean, you can take them off if you want to. Well, yeah. I mean, I meant I would have worn, worn shorts, but. Okay. Zach, you bets. wearing pants? Of course. Okay. Uh, first time in the middle seat for this, though. Mm. I, oh. I, I, I'm I not a tennis fan, but I feel like I'm at a tennis match. Just mm. going back and forth and back and forth. Got to check out of Andrew. Appreciate that, nice. Andrew. Good yes, for you. Yes. Yeah. Uh, how you doing? 
Professor, how is the uh, the Eagles offseason treated? <sighs> Doing well. Uh, this is kind of my time to, uh, you know, people were asking me the other day, like, you know, we haven't seen you tweet in a while and you know you're you know uh and part of it is i just need the time for mental recovery after the season were people tweeting that at you or people were stopping you both. on the streets to both. say both okay yeah both well some people i know um <laughs> not, uh, not one strangers. one instance of stranger on the street okay yeah um, he said hey i haven't heard seen you tweet yeah it's like what are you doing okay. uh tweet something now um and also uh yeah just uh people on twitter as well i need a little bit of a break you know and, and this is a good opportunity for me um you know i mean first of all i'm teaching four courses this semester so um that, that might be part of it as well but also um i do not watch college football like at all and so say what you said before <laughs> when you said the same <laughs> thing sorry to hear that yes. yeah, it's good. um sorry for, your loss. for <laughs> yeah. it helps my marriage for sure um given how into the eagles, so that's the how, and how into the eagles <laughs> i am it's good that i don't watch any college football at all like zero like i'll watch a little bit of the championship game uh every year and i'll say like how is there this big a difference between the best team and the second best team it was weird and and then i kind of turn it off and that's it that, that's like my only analysis of college football um because it never seems to be a close game but um the uh names seem fake to me you know like it's like sure. like you can't convince me there's really somebody named kool-aid mckinstry um until i see that person uh on a on a tv which i've never done um but uh yeah so i enjoy i've I've been watching all the shows and enjoying hearing all the fake names and and you know i, I downloaded the beast and the same names are there um <laughs> and you know listening to it would be a fun people like brandon thorne and fran you know talk about you know and, and, and coach flynn you know talk about the prospects is really fun for me but yeah, I, I just not my thing. I had a friend in college one time who who <laughs> um he would he he joked like how you know I, I did I did decently on an exam that like I, I didn't spend a lot of time studying for, and I said and I I didn't say this in a disparaging way. I'm like I went to class, like I I listened to the lectures, I I took notes, I did the readings, like that was that was the work. I, I didn't need to learn everything the night before. Like, right. unlike my friend who, who, who uh, wasn't going to class and was just kind of like cramming the night before. Um, and that's kind of, I'm not saying that like my draft prep is, is in October, but I, I feel sometimes I'm like, yeah, I, I remember this happening on the screen in front of me, as opposed to like two weeks before the draft. And that's why you still think Isaiah Simmons is a good player. <laughs> well, mm. Isaiah Simmons goes to Chippy the on the field and Chippy <laughs> in the booth. He needs a creative coach, uh, apparently. So it needs yes. a creative coach. <laughs> yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah, because that seems to be the problem. Uh, right. How about before we get to you know we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about what Zach and I think of some of these wide receivers, but um, your your reflections on what the Eagles did in free agency. Yeah, um, so I do love free agency. I, I, I do tweet a lot during that, um, and because I actually know those players. I was a little bit underwhelmed by um, what was done at linebacker. Like, I actually was hoping for hmm. more of a, you know, obvious, like, let's get this guy who's going to start and be good. And you don't view Devin sure. White that way? I'm just not sure. Okay. You know, like, like I, I obviously, Devin White has the pedigree. Obviously, he had, you know, good years in the NFL, or at least a good year. But um, he was benched for, like, sure. kind of random guy last year. You know, yeah. like, he was not playing very much in the playoffs. Barely played at all in their, in their last yeah. playoff game. And uh, I know he was injured and, and, and whatnot earlier in the season, but that's a little disturbing. And, and all the other things you hear about him, and, you know, like not being maybe as coachable and freelancing and things like that. It'll be interesting to see how that goes with a guy like Vic Fangio, who the Miami players don't seem to have a lot of nice right. things to say about him. <laughs> like it's like, is, how's that going to work? Um, so, yeah, I'm a little underwhelmed there. Obviously, Nicobe Dean, we haven't seen anything from him either. And then looking down the depth chart, um, there's kind of nothing there, you know, like, um, you know, Oren Burks ah, has been if only they had a young, capable linebacker. You know, it's funny, Bo, last night you did that awesome or I watched it last night yesterday. <laughs> um, uh, you had the or was it two days ago? What, whenever it was. Who knows? Yes. What, uh, that was great. It was edge rusher. It, day. I thought it was very funny that you didn't mention that the Eagles currently have an Ellis on the roster. Well, yeah, it's <laughs> true. <laughs> and, and you're actually calling for a second one. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, Noah Ellis is uh, still on the team, which is kind of funny. Yeah, but that he hasn't solved anything. I think. No, <laughs> I think that's true. I think Jonah is the is the one who was promised. That's yes. OK, well, hopefully, hopefully. Um, yeah, I just I, I I'm I'm a little concerned about that because linebackers don't tend to be, I don't know, like they're not 
something that Howie has targeted early in the draft. Yeah, sure. And when he's targeted like third rounders, they haven't always turned out well, right? Sure. And so and you're not plus buying, this year's uh, linebacker class seems to be terrible. Like when you just just looking at the yeah. round uh projections on right. the beast, like it like starts out in the second round and like you know, quickly gets to the third. And you're not buying like uh, you know, Zach Bond could moonlight there on the pinch. I don't know. So I mean I know Van Ginkel did that in Miami and that's what everyone's gonna talk about. Um uh, with Zach Bond, I, I I don't know. Like, what does Moonlight mean? Like, if you need a if you need a guy who's gonna be the third guy, sure, maybe you can do that. But is is he gonna? If he could do what Nolan Smith did last year and just be out there looking like a oh chicken with his head cut off in the penny package, just all by himself. Yeah, yeah no. Um, yeah, it, yeah. I'm sure he could do that. Actually, <laughs> I'm, I'm curious as a, as a longtime Eagles fan, uh, what's your stance on Jeremiah Trotter Jr.? Not in terms of e- evaluating him, but I've heard. Two schools of thoughts here. I, I've heard a thought from 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 Eagles fans who are like, "This would be the coolest thing ever," and then right. I heard a thought from some people like, "Why would they ever do this to him? <laughs> the only mm, the yeah. only thing he'll ever be measured up against is one of the best players in the past twenty five years." Yeah, that's a good point. Um, anytime these sons of players are you know coming into the league in any sport, my main reaction is. I can't believe I'm this old. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> so yeah. it's hard to get past that. But I agree with you in terms of the reaction to him. It would probably be easier for him, just like mental health wise, mm. to be, get drafted by literally anyone else. Sure. Right? Like, yeah, I think I think that's right. Yeah, yeah I think that's probably fair. But but there's well, a lot of people who, who board, want right? Jeremiah Trotter so badly. You know, Jeremiah Trotter Jr. so badly. So that's why uh, we'll have a, a linebacker day next week when when we'll get more into the Trotter discussion. But that's, you know, it's it's one thing if you draft a guy, if like Brent Selleck had a son and they drafted Brent Selleck, it'd be different than. I mean, as, as Matt Quinn would say, <laughs> I mean, there's no chance he can wear 87. <laughs> that's true. Yeah. The, um, or, or, or let's just take like, um, I, mean, I mean, actually Brent Selleck was a, was a good player. If they took like. Matt Tobin. <laughs> I don't think people remember him. Like Carell Buckhalter. <laughs> Who was like a real solid player for okay. them, but but like uh, they took Ralph Buckalder's son, it wouldn't be. How about Eldra Buckley? <laughs> People wouldn't. I don't think Eagles fans would be like, "Ooh, big oh, he's Eldra Buckley." Watching the show right now, <laughs> you're taking shots at Eldra Buckley. <laughs> but no, Jeremiah Trotter is the best linebacker the Eagles have had over the past 25 years, uh, and for them to take his his, his that's son. That's fire to Christian Ellis. But okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it'll be. Uh, that's gonna be a fascinating discussion. How about the uh, the shuffle? Along the edge with Hassan Reddick on Bryce Huffin. What do you make of that? Yeah, so weird. Um, it's very weird. I mean, uh, one of the things about the, um, you know, like the compensation for veterans in the in the trade market mm. this offseason, there's been a lot of talk about how low it's been. And this is where I have to kind of put on my economics professor I love your hat, economics professor hat. Which I, um, I don't know if you would actually love it. Zach, if you ever actually came and... Audited my class like you said you were going to. I want to. You might. Uh, I, I, you might I, change I, your mind. I do a daily show here. I, I would like to. Yeah. <laughs> you didn't do a daily show before when you said no, you that's were true. that's true. That's yeah, true. Yeah. Now you a, have the excuse. I was writing a book though, so okay. All right, well, <laughs> that, that was my excuse. That's fair. Yeah. And now you took this job, so you would have the excuse again. No, I trust yeah. me. I want to get better as a professor. So we can. You know, I can. I can. I have some flexibility over what time my classes are. So oh, if you tell me good. what time you're free, maybe I can. I can get that game theory class uh, set up for you next year. After two o'clock. Yeah, yeah. Well, actually, it's at three. 30 okay. so yeah you know, what's that? how's the book coming um it <laughs> it goes it gets sent in next month they we're going through the edits and some you know since i wrote oh my god i don't want to, there have been some changes in the organization um and on the roster since i wrote this since i wrote my manuscript yeah. so i need to update three chapters okay. um and that's happening the next week had to, the had to delete we're the excited. christian ellis chapter <laughs> Yes. Yeah, yeah. it's too bad. Uh, there's yeah, a player. Had, had he got relegated it, to the appendix. Yeah. 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 There are two popular players who retired. There's a <laughs> yeah. So there's there's a few things that have happened. Okay. Yeah. Understandable. Yep. Trying to think of who the players who retired <laughs> were. Um, who was my guy? Oh, man. oh, anyway, I'm blanking now. Um, the guy who was uh, Cameron Melvo. He he retired. Uh, there you go. Yes, yeah. yeah. your boy. Okay. That's what we got. All right. So the the edge rushers. Yeah, yeah. So uh, the tr- the the compensation for Hassan Reddick has been criticized, right? Like obviously as being lower than expected. Then you look at compensation for guys like Legarius Need. The economics professor hat part of me, and this isn't you don't need to be an economics professor to understand this, but like it's, I think it's under discussed. Is you're not paying to have the player for free. Right, you're paying for the right to pay the player. Yep. yep. Yeah. And the better the player is, the more you have to pay the player. Like Brian and, Burns, that was the yeah. Yeah, and the agents are involved in the process, and so like you need to convince the player to uh, come to you at the 
number that you're willing to play for. And depending on who is bargaining better there, you might not be getting a whole lot of surplus as the team, like for paying that player that much. And so you're not going to be willing to, you know, give up a lot for that right. And uh, in terms of it being 2026 as opposed to 2025, I know some people are like, 2026? There, I think the, the kind of classic market inefficiency of if you're Howie Roseman and you know you're going to be here in 2026 right. and 2027 and 2028, like you have that job security and you're making a trade with Joe Douglas, who doesn't have that job security, right? you are personally going to care more about the 2026 season than Joe Douglas is, right? Sure. And so that's a bit of a market inefficiency there. The, 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 the further in the future the pick is, the, the better the pick you're probably going to get if you have that um, long-term security. Now, owners should care about the future, unless they're really old, I guess. Um, but like fans also, like I've always said, it's, it's, it's a good thing if you're a fan, if you're an Eagles fan, as long as Howie Roseman isn't terrible as a GM, it's a good thing that he feels like he has job security because he sure. cares as much about the 2027 season as you do as a fan. Like, you're still going to be a fan in 2027, right? And so you should care as much about the 2027 season as the 2024 season. Like, of course, we're all naturally impatient, and so we care currently. We think we care more about the 2024 season. But my point there, I guess, is that, like, it being a future pick, it not being that high a pick shouldn't be that surprising. Yeah. In terms of the actual player... I mean, it's clearly a downgrade. Like, you're going from Hassan Reddick, who was super productive playing a lot of snaps, to a guy who's never shown that he can do that. So it'll be interesting to see, um, you know, if, you know, the, the age is, is, is good, obviously. If he does turn into a good player, it's good to get younger there. But, um, you know, I, I heard, you know, like a lot of people talking about, like, is this roster better now than at the end of the season? And unfortunately, I think it's very clearly not, right? Like, I mean, you lost Jason Kelsey, you lost Fletcher Cox, mm -hmm. you lost Hassan Reddick. Well, those are three of the best, like, you know, being yeah. conservative, three of the best 10 players on the team, right? And, <laughs> yeah, probably and, so. and, and you lost, you lost three of the, those three guys and you replaced them with, you know, a guy who was a rotational player on the Jets. You got CJ Gardner Johnson back, and I'm a big fan of him, but like, that's not, you know, making. Like, you wouldn't say, okay, we'll get rid of Fletcher Cox and Hassan Reddick and get CJ Gardner Johnson and Bryce Huff, and now the team's better. You know what I mean? So, and Devin White, we'll see, but I'm a little concerned about the, the defense. And I, you, you get rid of Jason Kelsey, and the guy you bring in on offense is Saquon Barkley. How about from, a, uh, from an economics yeah. framing, uh, like the, the willingness to pay for that position, the, yeah. uh, like the, the explanation that you're paying him Darnell Mooney money. What do you make of that whole? Yeah, I'm situation? totally of the, I am normally part of, I am like the running backs don't matter that much school, not don't matter at all, right. but like don't matter that much. Um, I do think that unless he can contribute a lot in the passing game and also be a good pass blocker, which actually matters. Like people say like, oh, you know, you're not paying for pass blocking, but the Eagles have had so many running backs who have been really bad at it recently. And, um, you know, the, the, in the Sirianni offense, typically on third down, the running back is staying in, kind of like seeing if there's a guy coming and then, you know, just going out for a quick check down. Like that's been the role. And they've been well, but he, so he won't bad actually get the check down, but he'll just go there. I mean, it's, it, it'll be like third and 10, so it doesn't matter. But yeah, sure. Yeah, that, that, that. But the point is that like, it matters if you're doing that well. You know, like, and, and teams will exploit it when they're not. And unfortunately, like, you know, Kenny Gainwell, like, wasn't very good at that. Like, he's been the third down back, and he hasn't been very good at it. Mm. Um, you know, Miles Sanders wasn't good at it. Um, didn't even play on third down because he wasn't good at it, you know? Um, and so Saquon Barkley being good at that and has been good at that throughout his career, I think, matters. And I'm, I don't think that's the most important thing, but I'm talking about that because I think it's been under-talked about. Um, and also, running backs have gotten so cheap. Like, it's like, I think the, the analytics community has sort of won that, you know, thing yeah. to the point that the running backs are like organizing and, and saying they should be getting more, right. getting paid more. Uh, and it, it has gotten so cheap now that the, the Mooney example is a good one. Like, yeah, sure. I'll take Saquon Barkley over, you know, replacement level wide receiver, which is like about what he costs. So, And, and then I think uh, to follow up on, on that, the, an argument that the Eagles would make behind the scenes is you can't necessarily look at what that salary is. You have to look at the percentage of the cap. Right. right. Is, is, right. is that one you buy when it comes to uh, the running back position? And, and the way I'll, I'll, I'll frame it, because it was framed to me this way, was that if you look at what Nick Chubb's contract was, he restructured it recently. But it would be the equ equivalent of like 
16, 17 million this year compared to Saquon Barkley making 13 million. Yeah, no, exactly. I think percentage of the cap is what matters. And also like, you know, you guys have talked about this um, before, but like Jeffrey Lurie being willing to pay cash today, Mm -hmm. you know, you know, structuring contracts, pushing money forward, that kind of thing. Uh, with the cap continually growing, it's always been strange to me that you're just allowed to do that at, at, with no interest. Like sure. you know, like yeah. it's like like in regular, like yes, yes. you know, in the real world, like you, you can just you buy a house. Just, and yeah, that. you can't just borrow money yeah. uh, that you use in the future. Um, and in the NFL, it's actually negative interest because the cap keeps growing. Yep. Uh, and so you are, um, you know, you're at a huge advantage there. And so yeah, I think I think that's what. That's what actually matters. I mean, it's not my money. Like, what matters for me is like how much of the cap it is. Sure. Like, is it preventing you from signing other players? And Saquon Barkley's not preventing this team from signing like other good players. I think I think it's fine. Yeah. All right. Well, good conversation that you can have with your friends. And if you're doing that, well, you probably want to have a nice cold Miller Light in your hand because a lot has changed over the years. But one thing that hasn't is the great taste of Miller Light. It was the original light beer, and to this day, it is still the best one. Miller Lite has more of the taste you want and less of the stuff you don't. So if you're sitting around debating Marvin Harrison Jr. and Malik Neighbors and Roma Dunze and Brock Bowers and you want to be sucking them back with your friends, Miller Lite has you covered. Miller Lite keeps it simple. Undebatable quality, great taste, only 96 calories. It's the beer that strips away everything you don't need and holds on to what matters most. A light beer that tastes like beer. Less filling and only 96 calories, the original light beer, since 1975. Times change, but you can always enjoy the great taste of Miller Lite. Tastes like Miller time. To get Miller Lite delivered right to your door, visit MillerLite.com slash P-H-L-Y birds, or you can find it pretty much anywhere that sells beer. Celebrate responsibly. Miller Brewing Company, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, 96 calories per 12 ounces. I don't know if you all saw the announcement the other day on the Anthony Gargano show or on our social media accounts, but Jim Salisbury is joining uh, PHLY as a contributor. Um, it, I've, I've followed the Phillies for uh, about 35 years. and I'm, I'm 38 years old, so probably since I was three or four years old. Uh, during my time following the, the Phillies, Jim Salisbury is the, the best Phillies reporter during that time. We're thrilled to have him here. But if you want to read his work, you're going to have to be a diehard member. Uh, please sign up. It is worth it for that and for many other stuff. We are going to have premium draft coverage. Um, you've seen it on on the show. I'm going to have um, some of these position-by-position position things, some, some mock drafts. Bo and I are working on um, some different things behind the scenes as, 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 as well. Uh, you can become a diehard member at allphly.com. And in, in addition to this exclusive uh, content, you will get great merchandise. You get 20% off events, a free shirt when you become a member. There's a member only Discord. Uh, so make sure you do that. Head over to allphly.com now and join the best sports fans in the city. Great read, Zach. Very excited to have uh, Jim Salisbury with us. Do you think, though, that somewhere in this great land of ours, Matt Gelb is lying on the ground with a, with a knife in his back? Oh, no. I, I, trust me, I love Matt Gelb. Um, yeah, I mean, they're. I, 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 I mean, Matt's off. Poor guy's bleeding out. No, Matt's amazing too. I mean, I'm saying Jim has a certain nostalgic value for mm. me too. Like I, I grew up. I grew up reading him in the Enquirer. I was watching him on NBC Sports Philly. Uh, I briefly worked with him at the Enquirer. I, I've. Uh, I mean, Jim's. Jim's an icon. I, I think Matt would tell you the same thing. So no, I. Trust me, Matt knows where I. Matt knows how I feel about him. I can see oh. Zach's screen. He has the <laughs> rankings. <here. laughs> no. Gelb is actually ninth on the list. I mean, no, Matt knows, how, Matt, Matt knows how I feel about him. Um, Just saying. Yeah. I, I, I heard it the same way, Matt. However you heard <laughs> please it. Please don't do this. Way. Please don't Notice do this. Notice that as soon as I said that, Zach immediately yeah. changed his screen. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You know what? It's funny. Stop. He was. He yeah. reflexively did. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Try to like, out what yeah. is actually up there, which, yeah. which is funny. Which is my wide receiver day. Well, let's talk wide receiver, Zach. Yeah. You want to talk buckets? I love your buckets, so let's see. Mm. Now, I have pared down the buckets. The buckets okay. used to go about 15 years back. I'm going last 10 years because the league has changed a little bit, although that does make the sample size smaller. These are not the most the, the, these are not predictive, but I think they're descriptive of the guys who, mm-hmm. who are here, right? So the young, productive, and fast, you look at the guys who were drafted in the first two rounds over the past 10 years, 12 of them hit, basically, if we're defining that as at least 1,000-yard NFL season. 14 of them did not. So this is not like they're definitely going to hit, but that's relative to the position, a fairly good hit rate. And as I said earlier, 
the guys who are in uh, this bucket. And again, this is better than a 4 5, 40, uh, at least 1,000 yards receiving in a season in college and did not stay the entirety of your um, eligibility. And that is Marvin Harrison Jr., Malik Neighbors, Brian Thomas, Xavier Worthy, Troy Franklin, all guys who are probably yeah. going to go in the top two rounds, right? Yeah, Franklin, I, I think, is would be in, in play there when the Eagles are drafting at 50 and 53. Those other guys, probably off the board, you would have to trade up or trade back from 20 for, you know. What would you make of if, I, I think one of the more realistic, shocking first round picks the Eagles could do, let's say they go Brian Thomas at 22. What would you make of that? Yeah, it, it would surprise me just based on the strength of the receivers in the, in this class. If you're looking at it based on tiers, and I thought Fran did a good job on, on Monday's show outlining that, and I, I know for a fact that's how the Eagles have their boards. Their their board is not a vertical board. It's, it's kind of horizontal, right? And, and so I just think when you look at, at, at tiers, there's going to be a drop-off uh, at certain positions from those tiers, and you have positions like offensive tackle, cornerback, where I think you can find – real good players there, and you might not find the same quality player thereafter. Um, that said, and I'm, I'm curious what both you guys think here, I think wide receivers a need for the Eagles. Um, and I've been consistent about this going back to the end of the offseason. Uh, upgrading third receiver, but also, and I've said this, I, I sound like a broken record, they've been remarkably lucky with the health and the totally. durability of A.J. Brown and Devontae Smith. Uh, we saw in week 18 when AJ got hurt, or when Devontae didn't play, rather, and then week in, and then in the playoffs when AJ got hurt, what this offense looks like without one of them. And the other thing too is, uh, Wes Watkins got a touchdown. <laughs> yeah, uh, Devontae is going to get paid soon, and this is not a 2024 problem or a 2025 problem even. But at some point here, the Eagles are going to have to figure out if they can pay both these guys top of the of the league money, and so there is a chance that. Um, the, a wide receiver that they take is, let's say, in round two, is your starting receiver in 2027. Yeah, I think that's right. Now, Brian Thomas, in case you don't know, is is the speedster from LSU, 6'3", 209, had almost 1,200 receiving yards in 2023, ran a 4.33 3 40 yard dash. I could, I could, you know, you, you could sell me if we're talking tiers that like he is the last, or he's sort of like a separate tier. I think yeah. I sort of view him as there's the top three guys. There's Brian Thomas, and then there's the next group of guys. And oh, so if okay. you view that as a sure. drop-off, maybe that's part of the appeal. Yeah, I don't know if I have that same opinion there. And I, I just think you're going to find really good receivers uh, on day two, whereas I don't feel that way about offensive tackle. Not to say that you need to push a position, but I think there's more of a drop-off at tackle than there is at wide receiver. Okay. Uh, next bucket, you've got the young and productive guys who are not so fast. Now, this is like the... The Mike Evans type, the yep. Devontae Adams type, these guys who who were uh, you know really really good in college came out but did not beat four or five, and this is actually the best hit rate of the early round hmm. guys: nine hits, six misses, uh, and a few late round hits. But actually, no prospects in this draft qualify unless you count Jalen Polk as uh, as young when he sort of stayed. He was like a fourth year junior yep. and it's a tough coding but uh not a lot of guys here young and fast not so productive not a great uh hit rate here three hits six misses and this is your ad mitchell Devontez walker bucket you like any either of those guys we talked to ad mitchell but yeah uh i well i really like ad mitchell and i like tez as well um i think that it was a fascinating story last year with him transferring to unc uh and kind of waiting for eligibility I, th I think he's he's an explosive player. Between those two, A.D. Mitchell, to me, has the upside to be a number one receiver in the league. Uh, and if you're taking a swing, I think A.D. AD Mitchell can hit. Um, but Tez Walker can, can be a good piece of a good wide receiver core. Next up, you've got the productive and fast, not so young. And this is, for first and second round picks, the, the worst bucket. Again, very small sample sizes. But uh, of the 14 guys who uh, were drafted at least two years ago, only one of them has hit, and that is Devontae Smith. Hmm. Now, the rest of them are, you know, we're, you're talking Anthony Miller, Corey Coleman, hmm. Paris Campbell, Jordan Matthews, Kevin White. Jordan Matthews might have had a 60-catch season, so maybe you would... <laughs> He said more than that, a 60-catch season, yeah. Uh, he was actually... Chase he had a 997-yard season. And I remember talking uh, to him after the game, and he lamented a drop that he had earlier in that year that would have pushed him <laughs> over a thousand. Jordan was always good to speak with. 
Uh, now Zay Flowers might might not change that too, but uh, this this uh, prospect group it sort of includes a Dunze if you're counting him as not left early. Xavier Leggett, who some people love, but how do you feel yeah. about Xavier Leggett? Yeah, you you hear the AJ Brown comp with him. Mm. Now the age, uh, if you're an, an if you're an ageist, you won't like him. He is uh, 23 already. He wasn't really productive until his senior year. But if if you look at it from like the Madden perspective, you know, 6'1", 221, around a four three nine forty, and was electric this past year with with South Carolina. So it's it's like a, a boomer bust type situation. Um, but he is a little older than that top bucket that you, that you referenced. Now the flip side here is while those guys have not done well in the first two rounds, it is a a, a place where there have been some late round hits, especially guys from smaller schools. Your hmm. your John Browns, your T Y Hiltons, Emmanuel Sanders. Adam Thielen and Tyree Kill, although there there aren't really any guys in the class who fit that description. Jacob Cowing from yeah. Arizona, who I kind of like a little bit. Yeah, good slot. Um, but anyway, Jed Fish special right there. Yeah, Howie Roseman's I, former I college roommate. Uh, guys who were just productive, stayed their whole careers, uh, but didn't break out until the end of their career and did not run fast. This is the JJ Ortega Whiteside group: four <laughs> hits, Ooh. three misses. JJ. <laughs> And the big... Uh, the, the, is J.J. a hit or a miss? How he's do you, a, he's how do you... a miss. Yeah. <laughs> the, the, the prospects here, Malachi Corley is the, the headliner here from Western Kentucky. Any thoughts mm-hmm. on him? Yeah, I mean, Malachi Corley is like a yards after the catch guy. Um, and, and, and you can see it with him. Uh, I probably have a big school bias. I'm sorry, Coach Flynn. But that is a good bucket in terms of some of those guys there. But, um, yeah, I mean, there are guys that I, I, I like more than Corley. Like, for instance, I'm looking... At Dane Brugler's rankings in front of me, he has Corley over Troy, over Troy Franklin. I would take Troy Franklin in, yeah. uh, among that that group, but Corley certainly like he's there's there's a reason to like him when 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 you watch his games. All right, let's talk about the guys who were just fast, so they did not produce enough and they stayed their whole career, but they are they can fly. Four hits in the first two rounds, seven misses, a few late round hits actually, but the this is the group where you've got Lad McConkey. Roman Wilson from Michigan, Ricky Pearsall from Florida, Jermaine Burton from Alabama are the headliners. How do you feel about that? That you know quadrant. Yeah, Jermaine Burton. I, I you know, that's Quartet, an off the rather. field question there, right? You you hear stuff about the coachability part of it. Um, <laughs> he was at Georgia and Alabama, and he was productive at both places. Uh, so if you're taking a swing later in the draft, I I hear that uh, Ricky Pearsall is. Um, he would be like he he's a he's a bigger guy, you know. He he kind of gets pegged as a slot sometimes, and you can see him playing in the slot. He he's he's a big body guy, uh, older too. Transferred last year to to Florida. He was at Arizona State before that. Um, and then Lad McConkey. There's a lot of people who really like Lad McConkey, and I and I and I can certainly see why. Uh, he he ran well. He performed well. Um, you can I don't think he'll be there when the Eagles pick, but um, yeah, I mean the the production was there. The testing numbers were there as well. All right, just to close this out, the guys who were just young, there's only been one in the draft in the first two rounds. That was Michael Thomas. That is where Keon Coleman comes from in this year. And then there are the guys who uh, didn't hit any of the baselines, none of the above. And the only miss there is Van Jefferson, but there have been some late-round hits, including Puka Nakua from last mm. year. That's where Brendan Rice, Johnny Wilson, and Aeneas Smith come from. So who are the guys yeah. that, that you do like? In the like day three, if we're talking adding to the the Eagles rotation. Yeah, you mentioned Smith from Texas A and M. Didn't have a lot of production, uh, or I shouldn't say didn't have prolific production. But when you watch Texas A and M, um, you saw someone who will translate to the NFL. Like I, I, I think Smith can have a role. And if you're thinking on day three, all right, this is a guy who's who I've I've said this. You're not drafting your your number one receiver, but you're drafting someone who can be part of a rotation, who can contribute on special teams. Uh, who can make plays with the ball in his hands? Uh, Smith jumps out to me there. Um, uh, Brendan Rice, you, you talk about the burden of uh, the last name, if you, if you will. I mean, he's Jerry Rice's son. But every time you watch Caleb Williams and you see who Caleb Williams was making plays to, it was it was Brendan Rice. Um, and you know, good size, six two, two oh eight. Uh, he's he's on the younger side. I mean, he's twenty two. He's not young, but he's not like an old guy. Um, but I, yeah, I, 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 th- I thought he was good, but of, of, if, if you're looking for like later round guys, um, Smith jumps out to me. I think for me, uh, I said Jalen Polk is my, my favorite guy mm-hmm. on day two relative to consensus. The guys who popped for me a little bit day three, I mentioned Jacob Cowing, uh, seems like a very smart yep. player. Um, I didn't think he played quite to the four, three, eight speed that he tested at, but I think a guy who could be 
you know, sort of like a Jason Avant type, as as Dana said before. Javon Baker, who we talked about, uh, flashed at the Senior Bowl. A little bit inconsistent, but I like what he brings to the table. I mean, 22 yards per catch in 2023 yeah. um, and plays like that, really good ball tracking skills, it seemed like. And then if you're looking for like a fun little guy, Anthony Gold from uh, mm. Oregon State was a little bit interesting to me. Jalen uh, McMillan, the other guy yeah, from Washington. From Washington. Sort of, I got sort of like Mac Hollins vibes okay. from him. And then Malik Washington from from, Washington, or from uh, Virginia, uh, uh, another interesting By player. way of Northwestern, yeah, smaller guy. Now there's yeah. one, uh, one local guy, Zach, Tulu Griffin from Mississippi State. Okay. Did not do much work on Tulu Griffin, or uh, did not do work on Tulu Griffin. Return specialist, if you okay. want to go there. He is from Philadelphia, ah. Mississippi. Oh, <laughs> you, got me, you got me worried because I, I thought I knew all the Philly guys. And I was like, It's where the uh, movie Mississippi Burning takes place, Philadelphia, Mississippi. With uh, Gene Hackman. Okay, sorry. Oh, okay, no, that's random. Yeah, that's a good nugget. Are you gonna um, watch that now, Zach? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Why not? I um, Hoosiers you, there, you, uh, Gene Hackman. You got me really worried because <laughs> I thought I knew every Philly guy in this draft, and I'm like, honestly, that's what I was hoping. I was like, wait, there's a Philly guy from Mississippi State. Um, I should know that, but all right, I just some point. return juice. Little, I, little, I, I did want to circle back, and, and and we can talk to both of you about this. Is um, Xavier Worthy is a fascinating question here, like the fastest guy ever at the combine, okay? And, like, I mean, to say elite speed, when, when, you, when you hear the Tyreek Hill comp, uh, it's warranted. Um, now, the flip side of that is John Ross never panned out when he was with the Bengals. John Ross was someone who the Eagles really liked in that 2017 draft and went top 10. Uh, was He was productive at, at Washington. When you, when you watch Xavier Worthy, there's a lot to like just before you saw him run. Then you saw him in, in run, and that probably pushed him up from like a second round guy to it's hard. It, it, this is the way I'll, I'll frame the question for you. If you're sitting there and you're saying you have a chance to get someone who's special by meaning like there aren't people in the world like this, is that type of speed an, enough for you to pull the trigger on someone who who is such an exception in that regard? Yeah, I, I'm. You know, I'm intrigued by Xavier Worthy. Now, when we when I watched him with Coach Flynn, I was I did not think that it was like he didn't look like Tyreek Hill to me. Okay. Um, and a lot of it was sort of schemed up stuff, it seemed like. But what what I feel like is underplayed is I mean, he was really, really productive. He had nine hundred and eighty receiving yards as a true freshman mm-hmm. at Texas, topped a thousand yards last year, was the was uh, you know, more productive than A. D. Mitchell in on the same team. I think that signal matters. If you're talking like, would you pull a trigger on the second round on a guy like this who, in theory, like, you know, the whole idea of Quez Watkins is that he's got this game-breaking speed, which they never really used, right? If it's Xavier Worthy and there is the upside that you talked about of eventually, you know, replacing maybe one of those wide receivers leaves, yeah, I would be in on in the second round. Yeah, I don't think he'll I, – I, I was talking more like 22. Oh, I would not take him at 22. Okay. It, does speed matter that much to you? To me, yeah, I, I mean, mean he is five eleven. If, if speed is the reason Quez Watkins was playing all those yeah. snaps, then I think you know, with Sirianni still here, I'm a little worried if you if you just bring a guy who's just fast, like you know, because yeah. then he'll be on the field just to stretch yeah, the defense. That's just to stretch defense. Yeah, uh, I, I don't know. I've always been a little bit skeptical about. A funny Xavier Worthy aside, um, unfortunate timing with the beast this week. Um, Xavier Worthy for all the recruiting nerds out there like me. Remember, he was committed to Michigan. Uh, he did not stay in Michigan. He 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 decided to go to Texas. Um, but but there was a, a note in the JJ McCarthy um, capsule that Dane Brugler had, where a scout said JJ McCarthy told all the um, all the Michigan recruits, if you want to chase girls or, or or do that kind of thing, don't don't come here. We're gonna be the class that turns around Michigan. And then they had four guys decommit, <laughs> and Xavier Worthy was one of them. So <laughs> um, just unfortunate. Man after growing hard. <laughs> <laughs> I would never decommit to Michigan. I I. <laughs> Chance to play in the big house? No, Come he's, on. he didn't. He, you you decommit if you're committed to your D. Oh, man, wow. You said that. I mean, I mean that's how you're framing yeah, it, right? But no. Um, I so, think the politically correct way to say that is chase skirts, by the way. <laughs> you think that's better? No. Uh, that was, that was I, I will pull up the <laughs> exact quote here while you guys saw it, just so I don't. I, I had a uh, quick trivia question for you since you mentioned Philadelphia, mm-hmm. Mississippi. Where was the world's first Philadelphia? The the place from which oh, the, the city gets its name. 
Greece? Turkey. Would I ask if it was Greece? Oh, no. <laughs> yes, it is in Turkey. Uh, it is an ancient Greek okay. city. Um, it is currently called Alashish. It is in southwestern Turkey. And there is essentially nothing there of the ancient city. So mm. you can't go see the ruins or anything. But uh, it's a kind of neat thing that I would tell my friends when I lived in Philly as a kid that, like, the original Philly is, no, in, in, Turkey. is in Turkey. Yeah. Uh, yeah. How's the, their football team? I don't know, but the uh, the the college football team of the university that I taught at um, was was horrendously bad. I could I could watch the practices from my balcony um, from the faculty housing, and 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 there was a football team, it, it, which was pretty cool. I thought. But they ran the ball all the time because the quarterback couldn't throw. So mm. Howie Roseman used to watch the Florida practices from a parking garage. He found a spot in a parking garage that overlooked the field, uh, and he would watch the Florida practices there, and he would scout the players. And as was once described to me, he saw a, a running back there, and he said, this guy's going to be great. And that running back turned into Fred Taylor. Mm. Who was he before? That? Yeah, was exactly. No, That's turned, like that running back was Fred Taylor, but turned out he was not known like around the country at, at that point. If he has um, the power to just turn people <laughs> into good players, that's, 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 that's amazing. The yeah, alchemy, yeah, yeah, yeah. no yeah. worries. So good. So the JJ McCarthy quote is: Before he signed, he was telling other Michigan recruits that if they wanted to party and chase girls, go somewhere else. His class was going to be the one that restored Michigan, mm. and then four guys decommitted. <laughs> so, but is that in the beast? Or you're saying four guys decommitted? No, not the four guys he committed. It, this was in the beast, not the decommitting part. But oh, okay. Xavier Worthy oh, was known as a guy who was committed to Michigan and then decommitted. I'm not saying one. So are to, you? Are you? I just thought is it, was, it out there that he decommitted because he wanted to chase girls, or that's no, just no, that's no, just no, that's, no, Zach's, no. that's Zach's theory. No, I'm yeah. not <laughs> suggesting that at all. I was saying it's unfortunate. I was saying he's I think known. You're very clearly suggesting that. Okay, he's known kind of. <laughs> Listen, someone. there's an opening in Philadelphia. You know, with with with, with re recent retirements. He was known if as really wants to come to Philadelphia. No. <laughs> um, he was known as, as someone who wow. decommitted from Michigan that year. That's all I was. I trust me. I think Xavier Worthy is awesome. I liked him actually before he ran the forty, mm -hmm. and then he's like, if you're the Kansas City Chiefs and you're trying to. Um, you know, find your Tyreek Hill replacement. Xavier, uh, Xavier Worthy. If he if he's on the board, you take Xavier Worthy. I I had a quick thought on something we we just didn't get to. Um, yeah, if, if there's time, it's Friday. We got time. Okay, yeah, well, it's the uh, you guys talked about it with Fran, and you kind of made the case for drafting the right tackle of the future in round one. Um, I've heard Shiel, uh talk about how it sorry who would be. Uh, there's this guy who has a podcast with. Ben Solak and uh, Michael Kist. Oh man, uh, let's not even get into. He's the jacked. I heard Bleacher these days. Stuff. Yeah, she's um, jacked these days. <laughs> yeah. So the uh, not Bleacher Report. Sorry, SB Nation is what I meant. But um, yeah. So Shield was talking about kind of questioning whether it's a good use of resources. Famously, he didn't think Dallas Goddard was. I actually was going to ask you guys um, whether you think Dallas Goddard was a good pick. Like mm. now, like like looking back. Was he a good pick? Uh, I think so, yes. He was good enough to overcome the fact that he didn't play yes. that much for half of his rookie. Yeah, he turned into being yeah. a very good player. Right. So yes. I agree. I agree. But but the threshold was really high, right? Like yes. he had to be one of the best tight ends in the league, and he probably became that just enough to to call yeah. it a good pick. Now, the big difference, obviously, with tackle is that if you're just a tackle, if you're not, I'm gonna try to show off a little bit of um homework that I did. If you're not, Fa what is it? Fautanu, Latham, and Fuaga, those are mm -hmm. the three guys with versatility, right? Basically, yes. If one of those guys plays guard and then moves to tackle, then he's playing the whole time. You could say, okay, well, you know, we drafted him in the first round, right tackle of the future, plus he fills an obvious need right now at right guard because we don't know. It doesn't seem like they like Tyler Steen very much, um, at least based on what we've seen so far. But I think I agree with Shiel that mm -hmm. it's like questionable use of resources for a team that like he's in a Super Bowl window now. The guy might not play at all for two years. Two years, like Lane said, he's going to play two years, right? So if he's not a guard, if it's just one of these tackle only guys, but what happened to 2026 matters just as much as 2024. Well, exactly, but you have the rookie contract thing, right? That's a real thing, and it's more real with tackles than it is with tight ends. Like it's not that big a deal that you had to pay Dallas Goddard. Yeah, like you're, he's a tight end, but. It matters when you're on a rookie contract, when you're a premium position, like a, yeah. like an offensive tackle who get paid a lot. Wasting two of those cheap years for a guy who's just sitting on the bench is not something that's ideal. Now, I think 2027 matters as much, but 
the Super Bowl window thing is real too. Like you know now, like whether the team has a chance. You know that you have AJ Brown and Devontae Smith here. You know that you know you have um, the offensive line still looks good. You know whatever. Like like there, there are things about the team that make you think right now is a like a, an opportunity. The NFC being weak in general, yeah. whatever, all those things. Other premium positions like corner, defensive line have more of an avenue for a player to contribute right away, even sure. if they're not entrenched starters. Plus, if you're drafting a corner in round one, I would hope that on this team, you would be a starter, right? Like, so, so there's that too. And then when it comes to the future mattering more, it's a very good question you're asking. Yes, I care about the future as much, but can't, are there no tackles in college right now who are going to be coming out in two years? Yeah, well, you can like when Lane Johnson, though, right? yeah. you can, but I guess like if you had the second pick in the draft and your quarterback's going to retire in two years, like I can see how you might want to pick a quarterback because yeah. like he's this amazing guy you're not going to be able to get. But the Eagles have the 22nd pick in the draft. Yeah. Like it's not a top five pick. It's not where they got Lane Johnson, who, by the way, did not sit. Lane Johnson played right away. Sure. Right. Um, and as we said the other day, they literally moved Todd Herman's position to accommodate Lane Johnson so he can play right away. Exactly. And and I, and I think that like I, I know that this is a tackle um you know, like a good draft for tackles. Yeah, I think that's but part that's of the over, selling point. That's overstated. It's like it's a little bit better than other years. Fine, but like this is twenty second pick. It's not. It's not a high enough pick that you're getting a guy who's going to be as that's sure fair. to be good as Lane Johnson mm -hmm. was. Like you picked Lane Johnson in the top five. That's like true. that's a very different. That's a very different thing. And um, I just think like the chance of being able to draft a similar guy when it's actually time for them to play in two years. Also, you don't know what your pick's going to be in two years. I mean, hopefully it won't be a top 10 pick, but maybe you'll, you know, convince the Saints to trade you one of their picks again and you will get a mm, top yeah. pick. You know, like you don't you just don't know. There's so much uncertainty. Maybe there will be another pandemic and that'll screw the Eagles. again. Oh, that would ones. that would. Yeah. Pandemic would be bad because I can't <laughs> handle another four win season. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> yeah, that's why I was ready. <laughs> but because it only yeah. affects the Eagles. Yes, I mean, that's, exactly. the, that's yeah, the unfair exactly. part of it. Yeah. Um, but my other thing is and we were talking about this a little bit before and I'm not sure like these examples don't all they're not all perfect, but. If the guy ends up being a really good right guard, mm -hmm. right, isn't there some chance that they're just going to want to keep him there and draft Lane Johnson's replacement sure, anyway? Sure. I mean, examples of this, Lane Johnson himself was supposed to be the left tackle of the future. Yeah. He was so good at right tackle that they didn't really think about moving him to left tackle after all those years of him playing right tackle at that level. I know it's a little different to go from guard to tackle. Uh, Landon Dickerson was drafted with the thought that maybe he would move to center. No one's talking about that now. And I think the main reason, I know they drafted Cam Jurgens, but the main reason is he's so good at guard. Sure. Right? Like, so when you're really good at the position that you play for two years, there's going to be some hesitancy to, to move off of that. Um, and then what have you done? You've drafted a guard in the first round. You know what I mean? Like, and, and it's like, like yes, but you drafted an all pro guard or a pro sure. bowl. Like, you so, so I, I think that's the nuance there is, yeah. is, is let's say, um, you know, for the purpose of, uh, let's say it's, it's JC Latham. Okay, who, who right. I think really fits that description. Okay, and he turns into these next two years. He's what Sean Andrews was, right? He's he's like a high level Pro Bowl caliber guard. Um, I the whole thing with me is with with positional value, and this is where Bo's correct when we talk about Brock Bowers is that if you're taking a position like that, and I'll put guard in the mix there early in the draft or in the first round, the threshold needs to be like Pro Bowl. All pro player. Right. So if the outcome there is what Landon what was with with Landon Dickerson or was with Lane Johnson, like you said, or he's one of the best players in the league at his position, I'm okay spending the 22 pick, the 22nd pick on a guy who's one of the best players at his position, even if it's, if it's not a premium position. Yeah, no, I, I understand. I mean, and maybe we shouldn't be conditioning on him being that good because yeah. that's not a high probability outcome. But um, the, it seems like with all these examples of people who were drafted played one position with the thought that maybe they'd move. Lane yep. Johnson, again, Landon Dickerson, Isaac Sayomalu to some degree. Sure. Uh, Jason Kelsey just didn't retire. Didn't retire. Yeah, yeah. but... Uh, yeah, I think, I, I think that that context matters. Like, Lane didn't move because Peters ended up playing longer than they expected. Like, if, if Peters had right. left after two years, they might have moved Lane. Yeah. Um, and if yeah. Kelsey retired, then, you know, Cam Jurgens wouldn't have played guard. And so, like, unless Lane Johnson's playing five more years, I don't think... That if this guy's great at right guard, they wouldn't just move him to maybe. right tackle. Maybe that's right. And also, maybe. right guard to right tackle would be a promotion in terms of like how much guys get paid. Yeah, true. Whereas Cam Jurgens is sort of getting a demotion, right? Yeah. Like he's moving from a position where he would get paid more to a position where he's going to get paid less when that's he gets true. that second contract. And I think it's, I don't know, like 
the thing that I thought of is I was just thinking of examples where this actually happened, where they drafted a guy, he played one position, then he moved. Cam Jurgens is going to be the first one that I remember where it's actually happening sure. on the Eagles. And it's working in part because, honestly, he wasn't that good at right guard. Like, if he had been unbelievably good at right guard, well, why not keep him there? Like, you've got yourself a, a really good right guard, find a center. You know what I mean? Like, find some veteran center or something, like, and then you don't have this it's hole. It's possible. Yeah. Um, but it's because he wasn't that great at right guard, and maybe they didn't expect him to be undersized, et cetera. Um, they like having big guards, you know, whatever. Uh, I, I just think, like... I I know, said it's, it it's a little think, telling I that think, the one time think, it worked is because the guy wasn't that good at the first. But they also haven't drafted that many. Like they've they've had such stability on the offensive line that there haven't been that many guys who were not drafted to just be backups, right? Um, yeah, I think is, Tyler Smith from Dallas is like the guy who fits this right. prototype. Like a tackle, they're going to let him play guard until it's ready to go, and then they, they let Tyron Smith go, and now he's going to be their starting left tackle. Right, and we'll see how that goes. And that, that and that's a that's a good example. I just think with the defense being the clear side of the ball that needs so so prospect help. agnostic without knowing the guys the yeah. position that you would feel most excited about at 22 is corner i think so and the reason is like i know Vic fangio can hide corners more than some defense coordinators because he has them play cover six and one of the corners is sort of hidden or whatever all that stuff you're not hiding last year's version of james bradbury sure like you're not hiding like you know slay's getting older like you don't mm -hmm. know if he's gonna have that drop off this year or next year either um, the other guys on the team, I mean, like, are, is, you're just projecting. Like, is Keely Ringo going to actually be able to start? Like, I don't know. Like, yeah. uh, do I want him to be the starter on day one? Probably not, yeah. right? Um, so well, I, I, yeah, I, think, I, I think corner would be the one. I would have loved, you know, trading for a guy like Snead, but, um, you know, a day one corner would excite me more than the right tackle of the future, who I think could be drafted in the future. Okay, and I hear your point there. Um, it's interesting you you framed it with 2018, with Dallas Goddard, from my understanding, and I, I feel strong saying this like publicly, the Eagles weren't necessarily targeting a tight end. What they were targeting was an offensive skill player. Um, they thought that they needed to add a young offensive skill player to that mix. Uh, if they stayed at 32 that year, uh, my understanding is Cortland Sutton would have been the pick. Um, mm -hmm. Christian Kirk was someone that they were hoping would fall to them where they were drafting. When Kirk went off the board, the last player they had in that skill position player bucket was Dallas Goddard. So the the like tight end logjam there was more because they were looking for a skill player. And so the way that I would equate that this year is I do think at 22, they're more apt to take a right tackle who can play right guard in, in, in year one. And that makes the Amarius Mims question a little more nuanced. And I think that's where someone like Latham, someone like Faltanu, um, someone like Fuaga would make Mims more is tackle sense. only, right? It certainly yeah. seems that way, yeah. yeah. Um, so I think they would really need to be convinced that this is like a rare player who in a different year is a top 15 pick to have a guy sit for two years in the first round. I think they would be more apt to go with like the Lander Dickerson route, like you mentioned, where mm -hmm. our, his eventual position is Lane Johnson's replacement. He can immediately help us here at uh, right guard. Right. right. And then the question becomes... Was it wise? Obviously, everything's a matter of trade-offs, but was it wise to take a guy who is not projected to be as good a tackle just because he can play guard? Right. And I now would, you're and, thinking, and, now and it's like a short-term like, thing yes, where if, you're sacrificing if, the long If I have a Marius Mims graded as a better prospect than yeah. Troy Fatanu, I would take him sure. over the guy who's who has a more immediate path to playing time. I think that is right. the point of the draft. Right. Yeah, right. I, I did think Brandon Thorne's answer yesterday... Um, was really telling when we asked him about right guard and he said they should look upgrade over Steen. It, he mentioned like there's a pathway to Steen being a functional starter, but he didn't mention mm -hmm. like Steen becoming, you know, a high level starter there. And there could be a school of thought in that building. I'm not saying this is how they think. This is me speculating that right guard is as much of a need or more of a need than a starting corner right now. Yeah, just, I think that's possible. Just because of the way and they listen, like they're, you know, they're, uh, there are plenty of uh, false negatives of, of offensive linemen in year one. Yeah. Like Tyler Steen could absolutely grow into be a good starting guard. But yeah, based on what we saw last year, I don't think they can yeah. pen him in to be the, a good starter. He played, he played one game, was a complete disaster. His best play was uh, the, the fumble he recovered when A.J. Brown ran into DeAndre Swift. He, he recovered that game, fumble, yeah. and the reason he recovered it is because he got knocked back so early... <laughs> 
on the <laughs> on the yeah. rep that he was on the ground already, yeah. and and the uh, fumble kind of rolled into his lap. That was brilliant. Coming. Yeah, yeah. brilliant. He knew he was going to run into a guy. I mean, to be able to read the play like that is just uh, you don't see that from a rookie yeah. normally. Yeah. Now it's yeah. easier to get replacement level production from right guard than it is from corner. But to the professor's point, uh, it's it would be easier for them to hide a corner. I think in this defense than would be to hide a, a right guard in this offense for what they want this offense to be. Well, especially with center being exactly. a question mark. Exactly. Uh, you know, yeah. you could hide a guard if it was Jason Kelsey playing next exactly. to Lane Johnson. Yep. But yeah, with, with Jurgens not being a sure thing, then yeah, I think that is yeah. a concern. All right. Good conversation. Anything else, uh, anything else you want to talk about, Professor? No, I don't think so. I think we're good. I'll be back, uh, hopefully. I um, hope so. Yeah, and if you were, you too were disappointed that the elevator was working today. <laughs> I was, I was, I was working on my sprints. <laughs> I was going to challenge Zach to a race. You would win. I'm I heard, a... I heard it's a narrow staircase, so I was going to use mm. the 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 box out. Oh, method. okay. Oh, yeah, okay. you're going to play dirty. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Of course. Yeah. Like in any race, you don't run straight. You run kind of into the guy. You know. I respect that. Yeah. Okay. All right, that'll do it for this episode of the PHOY Eagle Show. I think we're going to do a little something different on Monday. We're going to try to put together our approximation of what the Eagles like, you know, top 100 stacking might look like so that we can set ourselves up for success on draft day. But uh, that'll be a fun little thing to do. And we're going to continue going through the prospect, the, uh, the positions over the course of next week, some more guests coming up. So we look forward to that. Oh, I got to get this in. Sorry. Claire's in the Please. chat. Okay. Tomorrow, 9 a.m. T-ball season opener. Ooh. My son, Evren's team going up against the team that Claire coaches mm. that her son is on. So uh, it's going to be a big uh, rivalry game. Yeah, big rivalry game. So that's the that's the problem with T balls. You you can't give a little chin music. I would say no where it in. is, but all the sickos would show up and then be weird. So I I I, I won't do Dennis, that. Dennis, tweet more. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, just you know, I, I don't want to trash talk. But will you, you know, tweet us Claire, the result at least? I'm sure Claire will uh, be happy to um, to share it okay. next week. All yeah. right. Well, we look forward to uh, finding out how that goes. <laughs> and also, Zach. I mean, you must have felt. So much pride when the the recommendation from Coach Flynn was get to that center. You're like, ah, as if I didn't already know that. Got him yeah. a touchdown last week. Yeah, but you know what it worried me? Was the opposing coaches might be watching. Oh. Right, so. Are you using all 30 plays that you printed out or whatever? No, we, we struggled with that. And streamlined it? Streamlined it, but um, I made this uh, joke over text. It's, it's actually not a joke. It's, it's a true story. We have the team that's most in touch with their feelings of any team you can imagine because I introduced motion for the purpose of like trying to, to just free you guys up and, but to signal motion, I was telling them like scream, telling the quarterback scream, motion, motion, motion. And instead he screams emotion, emotion, emotion. Mm. So we have a team that, that before every snap, Love that. Saying, emotion, emotion, emotion. Um, so Which yeah, so it's, it's like your worst nightmare. <laughs> I'm in touch with my emotions. That's more intimidating of for, the, for the defense. <laughs> emotion, yeah. emotion, yeah. emotion. Yeah. yeah. It could be a psychological thing like Hayden Fry's pink locker room, right? Just like that. Yes. <laughs> Good stuff. We look forward to uh, finding out what the results are from all the competitions this weekend. That'll do it for this episode of the PHLY Eagles show. Thanks for watching. Talk to you on Monday. And oh, by the way, very quickly, CJ Uzama. Oh, yes. Eagles sign CJ Uzama, 31 <laughs> uh, year old tight end. And he's entering year 10, ended last season with a knee injury, but been a productive player. Seven years with Cincinnati, two years with the Jets. Uh, the Eagles like the draft proof their roster. And what I mean by that is they like to. Basically, not say we need to force position X. Not this has no effect on their draft plans. As a matter of fact, it's the other way around. It's done, so they don't have to worry about this. They can come out of the draft without a tight end and still have a functional depth chart. But I still think tight ends in play in the draft. Well done. Six tight ends on the roster right now, which is kind of funny. Can you name all six? Oh, of course. Dallas Goddard, C.J. Zuma, Grant Calcaterra, Alberto, Noah Tongiai, and E.J. Jenkins. E.J. Jenkins. They got a C.J. and an E.J. So uh, that's important. <laughs> Looking forward. DJ in the draft. Uh, okay. Now that really will do it for the <laughs> PHL My Eagles podcast. We will talk to you on Monday. Thanks to Andrew for producing today. And as always, we love you. We all silly like the mayor.